Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine's Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's very important program, She's Gone, Shedding Light on Domestic Violence. Today's Zoominar, which is being recorded, is in partnership with the Moment Gallery, Remember the Women Institute, She's Gone, Strong in Collection, and in cooperation with the Embassy of Israel. Before I introduce our panel of speakers, Dr. Rochelle G. Seidel, founder and executive director of Remember the Women Institute, and Tammy ben Hayim, Minister for Public Diplomacy at the Embassy of Israel, will join us to say a few words. Rochelle? Thank you, Suzanne. Remember the Women Institute's mission since our founding 25 years ago has been including women in history and telling women's stories. Most of our work has been about women during the Holocaust. And then this led to our work on the mostly untold stories at the time of sexual violence during the Holocaust. And from that, through a connection that was made by the culture department of the Consulate General of Israel in New York, we were introduced to Israeli artist Karen Goldstein and her She's Gone installation, which is about a different but not unrelated form of violence against women, domestic or intimate partner violence. And despite many obstacles that were caused by the COVID-19 pandemic during these last almost two years, last week we were finally able to present a live mini exhibition at the Strongman Collection in Washington, DC, thanks to the generosity and cooperation of gallery owner Robin Strongman. The exhibit features the clothing and the stories of murder victims of domestic violence in an effort to raise consciousness about this heinous global situation made even worse by the pandemic. Karen Goldstein, who you will hear in a few minutes, created She's Gone by collecting garments of Israeli murder victims of domestic violence. Remember the Women Institute brought three of these garments to the United States and we added two more from American victims, Jana Mackey and Simonette Mapes. Watch for the video of the Washington exhibition coming soon on our website, rememberwomen.org. Thank you to Moment Magazine and everyone who cooperated to make the exhibition possible. Um, I also want to acknowledge the help of the Embassy of Israel to the United States. And now I would like to introduce Minister Tammy ben Haim, Minister for Public Di Diplomacy at the Israel Embassy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rochelle. And of course, thank you, Nadine Epstein and Susan Borden from uh, Moment Magazine for hosting uh, this webinar. Uh, to Robin Strogan, which you mentioned as well from the Strogan Collection for presenting uh, the exhibit in such a respectful and beautiful way. And of course, uh, and you mentioned her, but obviously Karen Goldstein for creating uh, this powerful and I think uh, mesmerizing display uh, which really reverberates and, and shows the stories of these women and millions of women all over the world in Israel and the US, but everywhere uh, have suffered from intimate partner uh, violence. And we need, uh, we need to talk about these stories and especially um, in the past two years with uh, COVID that they found themselves at times trapped or in lockdown in their own houses uh, with their abusers. So I think uh, it's an opportune time and you said it was delayed a bit, but I think, you know, it's definitely the time to shed the light and talk about this issue. And as the Embassy of Israel and personally as well, uh, we're very honored and I think we're fortunate that we're able to uh, be with the group of, of you and help bring their stories to light, help start a conversation about it. And understand that, you know, it's not just, it's things that happening. We might not see them. We don't go into everybody's home or friends, but it's in every part of the community and everywhere. So thank you uh, so much for allowing us to be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the webinar. Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you, Minister Ben Hayim. We appreciate you joining us today and for helping to bring the program to our audience. Now, let me introduce today's panel. Karen Goldstein is an Israeli documentary film director, activist and creator of the international art installation She's Gone, which is a protest against gender-based violence. Adi Levy is a creative director, designer, cultural entrepreneur, vegan activist, and co-founder of Alfred Cooperative Institute for Art and Culture in Tel Aviv. 
He is the co-director and designer of the She's Gone Project. Rachel Louise Snyder is the author of No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us, which was awarded the 2018 Lucas Work in Progress Award and won the 2020 New York Public Library's Bernstein Award for Excellence in Journalism, as well as the Sidney Hillman Book Award for Social Justice. Dr. Shoshana Friedman is the Executive Director of Shalom Task Force. She is a trauma-informed therapist and an advocate where she has worked in the field of domestic abuse and family violence with the Jewish community for close to 20 years. Shana was recently appointed to the New York City Mayor's Office to end Domestic and Gender-Based Violence Advisory Board. And serving as moderator today is Robin Strongen, a fierce advocate for women. Robin recently created the Strongen Collection in Washington, D.C., which is currently showing some pieces from the She's Gone art installation. Robin is co-founder of the Center for Contemporary Political Art and is a strategic advisor for the Foundation for Art and Healing, currently focused on issues related to loneliness and social isolation. Robin is co-founder of the Moment Gallery, a new project recently launched by Moment Magazine. Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. And I also want to um, take a moment to thank uh, Rochelle. She was really the glue that brought everybody together for um, today's program, as well as the exhibition. And it's just been a real privilege working with you, Rochelle. Um, and, and one of the things I want to quote one sentence that Rochelle had talked about the when we were talking about the installation itself, you wrote, that, um, and I'm quoting you now, these garments are silent testimonies of meaningful lives filled with hopes and dreams which were abruptly and violently taken. They, they bear within their folds tales of absence and grief. And really, when you are in the exhibit, it really is a gut punch because what Karen and Adi have been able to create is the personal stories of these individual people, these human beings, and seeing their clothing, their shoes, their boots really takes your breath away. And I will share with everybody, we have had in the brief period of time that the exhibit has been installed, many, many people walking through of all ages, um, the other night I was closing up the gallery and there was a knock at the door and there was a student from GW who had heard about the exhibit through another student and she made her way over to the gallery by herself. She felt compelled to see this exhibit and it took her a long time to go through and understand this is an intimate small space. And when she was done, she said, please let the artist know how powerful she was so moved. We had to sit for a while and talk and it's really having real world affect people who go through it, including one or two women who could not bring themselves to go into the exhibit for whatever personal reason. So it really has a, a strong impact on everybody who sees it. And, and what I'd like to start with our conversation, Karen, is for you to share with the audience, what was it that prompted you? How did you conceive and come up with this? What was the impetus behind this, this exhibit for you? Excellent. We can hear I, I am. Um... The idea came to me something like um, five years ago when I heard again about another murder of another young woman. She was only 23 and she was murdered with her two little young boys. And I was very upset and I was very angry. And I thought to myself that I have with my limited uh, sources, I am only a filmmaker. And I must look for something, for some image that will express my feelings. And then I thought, what become of all those garments, of all those women? Started to look for them. Wow. So what, what was that like? Looking When you reached out to the families, I can imagine it's one of the most if not the most painful moments in, in, in a family's life to lose someone, lose someone young, violently, et cetera, to, to ask for something as 
personal and intimate as a piece of clothing. What was that like? Was it different for each family with whom you met or how, how did that work? Actually, it was. Uh, as you can imagine, we, 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 uh, we met the families uh, when they were devastated, totally. We are talking about a mother that she had to heard about the murder of her daughter only from the news. Uh, and we talk about a grandmother that, that she had to raise uh, two uh, young orphans. Um, it wasn't so easy at the beginning because we had to gain their trust. We had to uh, explain the purpose, the goal. And actually, to be honest, we didn't know it for sure when we just uh, uh, started. So it took us some time until we defined the goal. Um, it took like two, three times to, to get there again and again and to explain. And um, sometimes it was the last, uh, garment and the last memory that they had from her daughter or her sister or the mother. So it was a very difficult uh, situation. A um, lot of pain. We met a lot of pain. I, I, I can't even imagine, of course. And so with, with all of that in mind, your anger, their pain, what is it that you hope people who experience the installation take away with? What, what do you hope this exhibit will be able to, to do for the memory of these women and their families? Yeah, first of course, I hope people will get excited, get emotion. I want to make them feel, to feel anger, to feel sadness, to feel rage, to feel uh, at first. Then I hope uh, to encourage uh, action and promote dialogue, of course. Um, I, I, of course, and then if any woman in the uh, audience, <laughs> um, if she will have courage uh, to look for help and to, um, it will be more than enough for me, at least to be able to help somebody who needs to reach out. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Adi, let me ask you, when we were putting the program together, it was very, very obvious to us that, you know, we're a lot of women on the program, but, you know, domestic abuse is, is not just a women's issue or a woman's problem that goes without saying. And so we're really delighted that you are able to be here in many capacities, really. Um, the work that you did, we worked together on and installing the exhibit and you're doing a lot of the creative work I'm um, really just added to the depth of what we're able to do in terms of sharing the the stories of who these women are as as a man and an activist what is it about this issue in particular um, do you want to share with us that drew you in and and how you got to work with Karen on this particular project no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. No pr um, well, that's a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, I will start from from this, the mid question. Um, quite surprisingly, I came. Um, I I'm a vegan activist, and I really care about animal rights and animal liberation. And I think that I owe a big thank you to this process I went through, because um, it made me understand how really very good people can do very bad things. And you don't need to be a bad person to do bad things. And the way I look at, looked at myself when I realized that I am, I think that I love animals, but actually I eat them or I care about my dog, but there are many other dogs. It really helped me understand the, the cognitive dissonance that we have in our lives about how we perceive ourselves about what we actually do, about accountability, and about how, about mindset, how we can take control about our mindset and how we should think about the victim. So always, and to, to listen and to be open 
for the fact that the way we see life and what we experience is completely different than someone else who is going through a completely different uh, system of pressures and of oppression. So when I uh, met Karen, I was initially um, invited to be the designer and the, the one who will do the branding for the project. But I very, very quickly, once I saw the material and once I started working with Karen, I felt deep, deep uh, connection and, um, and um, empathy about the, the issue. And I told Karen that I would uh, like to actually um, donate a big amount of my, of my work back to the project. And I started to help here and there. And at some stage, Karen told me, listen, um, there's something wrong with the website. And so I asked her what, and she said, uh, you're not appearing on the team page. Mm. So yada, yada, yada. And we became actually co-directors and now we're reading it full power on the international scale of, of the project. What kind of feedback have you heard from other men who have viewed the exhibit? Have you had a chance to speak with men in particular? I actually didn't get the chance to talk with a lot of men in particular. Um, I saw men uh, watching and seeing the, and experiencing the exhibition. Um, I think it's really interesting. It's an interesting question because there are more women watching the exhibition and men, I think it really catches them in a way or confronts them or mirroring them in a way that they are always, when they look, at least from what I've seen, they look like in very, like a kind of a grave face and they go and maybe they feel a bit, I don't know, they don't know how to, to, de to conduct themselves maybe. And I think this is one of the big problems that this project is really addressing, which is the lack of, of emotional tools of many men to express emotions. So this is, and many times that's the reason that things blow up because there's no way to channel things while they just start in a way. Uh, this is one of the issues that we need to deal with. It is, and it's actually the perfect segue to our next speaker, Rachel, who has done mammoth work on um, looking at the issue, doing the research and speaking with so many people, men and women, and um, Rachel, you're, I, as you know, you're, the book just, every time I, I go through it, it takes my breath away and I learn something new. Um, I know that the economist had said about your book that the issue that you were writing about domestic violence, they say it is the dark matter of violent crime, unseen but everywhere a book that manages to be both personal and panoramic, angry and hopeful. And, and I hope what we learn at the end of this hour with everybody here is that it, it is a tremendous problem. The numbers are rising, but, but there is some hope on the horizon because there are tools and things we can do. And as you show in your book, through many, many of the stories, there there really are lessons learned and tools to deal with things like what you were talking about, D is dealing with emotion. And, you know, it is, if it was a simple, we would have fixed it. So Rachel, share a story or two, if you would, that you think help eliminate, whether it's, you know, one of the men that you focused on or what, so take it away, Rachel. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Robin. And Adi, I loved, I loved the way you framed men's um, difficulty connecting with the exhibit. I, you know, I, I mean, what I, what I always want to say is like domestic violence is not a woman's problem. It is, it is a men's problem, right? Women are not beating themselves. Women are not, you know, killing themselves. Um, but, but, it's that's limiting as well. It's everybody's problem. Anybody can be an abuser. Anybody can be a victim. And I think we fall into stereotypes when we, when we try to, you know, pigeonhole what a victim should look or act like or be like, and what an abuser should look or act or be like. And I sat in on 
my very first ever abuser intervention class outside of Boston years ago, 10, probably 10 years ago now. And I remember thinking beforehand, oh, I have, you know, I have four brothers. So I, I know what men are like, like, I, you know, I used to fight with them, whatever. <laughs> And I, I had this image of like these men that would walk into the room and be, I don't know, just have a sort of energy about them that, that felt edgy, right? And there were seven of them and they walked in and like none of them had even the slightest edge. One kid was 19 years old, came from a family of academics. Both his parents were professors. Another guy was, you know, in a suit and tie had just come from work, he worked in insurance or something, you know, something sort of mundane. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, these, I would go out for a beer with any of these guys, like any of them. And so I think we have to get the image of monster sort of out of our heads when we think about them, because that is in a sense, a way to distance ourselves from really dealing with the problem. I'll tell you a really quick story about a guy in my book named Dante. And Dante had gone through um, an anti-domestic violence program in prison. He, he went to prison for, for hitting his girlfriend really hard over the head, like hit her so hard she was foaming at the mouth. And then he, he got accepted into this anti-domestic violence program, went through the whole thing, got out, was on probation, and was learning to be a peer leader for the same program. He was like this crazy, fabulous success story of this guy who'd grown up in East Oakland, surrounded by violence, no father figure to model, you know, good behavior. His father died when he was very young. Um, and he was doing really well. And then one night, while he was on probation, he broke curfew. And curfew was 7 p.m., by the way. So it's not like he was out at, you know, midnight, right? He was out at like a normal dinner hour for the rest of us. And he called me from prison. He was put back in prison for violating his probation. And he said, yeah, I had been violating my probation for months because the program that he was, that the anti-domestic violence program that he was working in paid him something like $7 an hour in San Francisco, not enough to live on. So he was consciously breaking uh, his, his probation by going to work at night, second shift as a janitor. And he got thrown back in, in uh, prison for another three years, three years. And he got out in July and he has been struggling ever since. He's struggling with drugs. He's sort of in and out of gangs. I. I hear from him every now and again, but I bring up his point. I bring up his story because his story is real. The one thing I've always loved about Dante is that he doesn't lie to me. Like if he's doing drugs, he sort of laughs and tells me and says, yeah, I know I'm, I'm an idiot. But we cannot expect to have any kind of effect on domestic violence when we send somebody like him to a program and then right back out into the community with what is essentially an impossibility, right? No income, you know, we, we expect far more of someone like him than we ourselves would be capable of. There's no one in this Zoom, no one who would be capable of living in San Francisco on 750 an hour. You know, I don't care how many people you cram into a, a studio apartment. So I think, it's a, I think it's a really important lesson for us that in order to, support victims, we also have to try to get anti-violence programs that work. So I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and in the book, you really go into a lot of the background and the detail and, and it, it, it's really just, it just consumes you. You also talk a lot about myths that there's a lot about domestic violence that we don't really understand or we know nominally. What's an example of some of the myths we should be aware of so that we get smarter? That's a, it's a great question. Um, so one is sort of what I already talked about that, you know, abusers are monsters. Like they're not, they're me, they're you, they're, they can be anybody, right? 
but the other myth uh, that goes right along with that is that victims are a certain way. We want our victims to be perfect. We don't want our victims to fight back. We don't want our victims to have any kind of drug or alcohol problems. We want our victims to be perfect mothers. We never want our victims to get angry themselves and maybe get physically violent or retaliatory with their abusers. And all of these are myths. I would say um, perhaps the most damaging myth is the idea that if things were bad enough, a victim would just leave. Or that in fact, we, we put the impetus for leaving on a victim when we have so many um, cultural and sort of bureaucratic systems that hold victims in place. You know, you can't just take your abuser's name off of a lease or the, a, a deed to a house or a bank account. You can't just send your kids to school without, you know, both parents' signatures. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which we hold victims in place and we also expect them to show up for court, even though, you know, we generally don't hold abusers if they can bail themselves out. So there's all these ways in which we are putting the responsibility on victims for their own, for their own sort of well-being and safety, when in fact those systems should be much better at kind of holding them, keeping them in their community, keeping them safe. I always say, you know, it's not the victims should, who should leave their homes, it's the abusers. Like, why are we building, building shelters for victims? We should have those shelters for abusers. Let the victim stay in the house. You know, she's not doing anything wrong. He's not doing anything wrong, whoever the victim is. Um, so far, I haven't, in the United States anyway, I haven't uh, found anyone willing to take on that model, but I keep trying, right? Like, let's make a shelter for abusers of domestic violence. Well, and I think part of the problem, and I'll bring it back, Karen, to your exhibit is when people go through the exhibit, the conversations get started. And when the conversations get started, some of these myths can be dealt with. Some of the language can start to be changed, that it isn't a woman's issue, that, you know, the questions that are asked, why doesn't she just leave, just like you were talking about, we could start to reframe some of this. And I think really one of the things we've seen during COVID, for example, are the numbers skyrocket. We've seen with all of the, the gun issues at, in, in the United States, it's also, so there's so many other social issues that are exacerbating this particular problem. But I know Shauna, you're gonna be speaking about some of the things that we can actually do. And Rachel, in your book, no visible bruises. There are lists of resources that people can use, um, certainly hotlines, but beyond hotlines. And there are tactics, there are technologies, there are um, training for police departments and the importance of how a police officer takes a report because if it's an incomplete report, a prosecutor can't use it. So there are some very tangible, low hanging fruit steps that can be taken in our minute or so you want to touch on those before we move over to Shauna just a couple of hopeful um, possibilities of getting started on on some positive solutions sure I mean I would say let's I what I would actually say this is incredibly controversial but let's keep law enforcement out of it for now okay. there's a million Mine. ways in which law enforcement are ineffective or exacerbate a situation and make a situation worse but I think our faith leaders, for example, could be doing much more. I think domestic violence agencies, every time they have a training, they should invite faith leaders, social workers from our kids' schools, and human resources managers. I think bringing those three groups, groups into the conversation around domestic violence is one of the ways that a community can begin to support, not just the victim and, and the children, but also that abuser, because I'll tell you what, I've never met a happy abuser ever, right? So I think, um, and, and all of that should happen before we try to go to, to, to law enforcement or the judiciary, because all of those interact with these families all the time. Children need to know that it's not normal, that it's not okay, that there are resources, that there are things they can learn. They also need to know that they're not destined to grow up 
as either victims or, or abusers themselves. So um, I would say bringing in those three groups, HR managers, social workers from schools, starting in middle school, if not earlier, and faith leaders. And I would probably add just a plug for the arts community, because I do think when you bring in creatives, there's a way of reaching audiences through a different dynamic and a different medium that, that sometimes really breaks through in an unexpected way. And so I will just Absolutely. put that right there. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, I'm a writer, so you're speaking to the choir. Yeah, here no, I, I you know, speech. we've seen a yeah. lot with dance and, and, and other artistic formats that really are able to reach people, victims, abusers, and others who want to help solve the problem in a way that certainly legislation has, everything has a role. It's, it's way too complex and multifaceted to have one solution fix everything. So... I think the combination is really where we need to be focusing. And with that, Shauna, let me ask you if I could um, to first tell us a little bit about what Shalom uh, Task Force is and the mission, and then, then we'll get to it. Sure, I just wanted to reflect on something Rachel just said, and we talk about myths. Um, I think one of the myths we really have to respond to, um, and this is related to the work I do at Shalom Task Force, is I think there's myths about, and there's ideas about who the victims are, like Rachel said, that they have to be perfect, but also like, oh, they're in Israel or they're in the larger general community. And I think here in, in this forum, in Moment Magazine, which is, you know, within the Jewish community, we have to remember that the myth, you know, we want to get rid of the myth that domestic violence doesn't happen here in all of our communities and that domestic violence really crosses every single demographic. Um, and so at Shalom Task Force, I mean, to bring it to there is that um, and in many ways, I have to say that, you know, we look at statistics like one in three women are hurt and one in five men. Um, we have some statistics um, in the Jewish community, JWI and my colleagues, JWI and UJA, I, I, I um, shared some, um, did some work over COVID around that, um, where, um, for the next slide, um, where we know that 43% um, um, hold on, the next one's better, I think. Um, I, I, it's interesting because, Rachel, I also put in there that um, eight, that was 8 million hours, I mean, days of work are missed by domestic violence victims. So this isn't just an issue of women or men. This is a, like, a, a society issue, right? Like, homelessness, that is a domestic violence issue. Gun violence, that is a domestic violence issue. Poverty, that is a domestic violence issue. There's no uh, issue that does not intersect with domestic violence. We just don't see it. It really lives in the shadow and that's how it exists, right? It, it exists as being a shadow in silence. But if we look at the Jewish community, what we do know about the Jewish community, that UJ's study that just came out, that 34% of victims said that the, the violence worsened over the pandemic. So it's coming out of the shadow, right? We're having these conversations. And um, they also, 33% said so they, they didn't think it was serious enough. And I, and I wonder about that. Like it's in serious and they didn't feel they would get the help they need. And 100% of Jewish victims talk about the lack of financial resources. So we're not even at the place of talking to law enforcement. We can't even get there, right? Because they can't even conceive of a life. How am I going to manage that? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring back a bit how we can do. But let me just talk a little bit about um, Shalom Task Force. So Shalom Task Force was created. It's a great story. I was not part of it then, but I'm proud to be part of it now um, in 1993. And to give context, that's before like the O.J. Simpson trial. That's before the Violence Against Women's Act before it was really in the discourse, where in Long Island, a pediatrician in one of the Jewish communities approached the moms and said, there are some children I'm seeing in my practice whose mothers are being, are, who are Jewish moms, who are being victimized. And they don't have anywhere to go within the community. And they don't know have anywhere to go. They don't want to leave, they don't want to have to choose between community and safety. They have nowhere to go. And these women, many who are the founding board members and still very involved in our agency started an agency and in that agency they stayed they said we're gonna we're gonna find a way to respond we're gonna be here to listen to hear to, to validate and help some help people get the help they need and that's the core of our mission um, and we started a hotline it's mostly volunteer run we have a chat line now and we've, we've answered over twenty six thousand calls um, so it certainly is a place that within the community people know that they can go um, and this is the whole Jewish community. Um, they could go to be heard and believed and referred for services. We also have a legal department because that is often what is needed, right? To look to explore legal remedies. And we do education, um, which we could talk about being probably the most hopeful of all of it. Um, so it's really, it's just important to understand that we wanna get, we wanna, um, I think about the changes over the years and I wanna think about like when we listen to and we see 
um, exhibits like this, and it's so important, Robin, I have to really um, echo this. I think it's so important for people to learn about this in different ways. Some people learn by reading. Rachel's book is a required reading for all of our staff team and volunteers, because um, in many ways, I think it's, it's probably the best portrayal of what domestic violence is. And what's so compelling about it, it isn't only about the, the terrible homicide at the end. It teaches about the coercive control and the, phys the non-physical abuse, which is such an important part, because if we can't understand that piece, we're missing, we're missing how to help people stay safe, right? Because, you know, the last act of, of, of the, the homicide, right, is, is not the whole experience. Um, these, the victims, the women and men who are, are being hurt are living with a terrorist, and we have to understand that dynamic to be able to respond to it um, as a community and as a society. Um, but it's really, it's critically important that we don't think about this as an other issue. Right. So if we can relate to it through art, we relate through writing, we relate to, to listening to lectures, relate to bringing being awareness to our community, then we're able to to think about um, we're able to think about um, solutions together. Really think about solutions together. So um, for somebody in the audience who's listening and mm -hmm. is worried about somebody, not sure. themselves but somebody else, what do they do? What yeah, we just do? finished Hanukkah and we. Use this, um, we use this um, analogy in our agency around Hanukkah about being the shamash. So when you're lighting your menorah, right, you have one, we have one candle and we use that to, to give the light to the other ones. And it's a really nice analogy in this sense of you do not have to be everything, but you want to give the light to the other. And as a community, we have to learn how to shed light on this. So if you know someone who is going through something, right, you are not responsible for it to be their savior. That is just, that's not your responsibility. You're there to be helpful. And if you can let go of that, that urgent need, right? Like you want to go in there and take the person away and that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work because you're mimicking the dynamic of power and control that is there in the abusive relationship. And also these are really complicated cases. Like they're truly, truly complicated. And that could make it even more dangerous, right? To go in there and make a big change but you can you could use statements of I believe you I'm here to support you I know that there are resources out there and that we'll we'll put up and I'm sure that we'll make available we put together a few resources that are national because people are from all over but there are resources out there right that you could say to someone I might not all the end of the answers but I know there are people out there that could help you find answers right and and I think Rachel you talk about that in your book right we want to make sure people know right that they could be heard and believed and sometimes their friend might not be the right person to hear it all um, because they might be too involved, but to, to believe, I, I believe you, no one deserves this. I understand it's not, it's not easy. And there are places for you. And the question of, you know, I love how you said this, like, why doesn't she just leave? The way we reframe it is we use like, what are the barriers to getting help, right? Like, what are the barriers? Because when we, we say, why doesn't she leave? If it's hard enough, why doesn't she leave? It's, then you're really putting all the responsibility on her. And yes, the, the, the person who's abusive, the one that hurts should be the one removed from the situation. And that should be addressed separately. But what are the barriers? And the barriers often is that they don't, people don't know where to go or they don't actually believe there's gonna be any help out there. And it's so, when you decide that you wanna make a decision, you're deciding to look at your options. There are so many systems you enter. I often use this um, visual where I put like a superwoman in the middle of all these concentric circles. So we expect the victims to be these super people, right? They have to, they leave this situation, they are traumatized, their sense of self is shattered. They might be physically hurt, everything. They have post-traumatic stress disorder, everything that's going on. And they have every system, child welfare system, the legal system. They have to deal with the economic system. They are basically have to do all this. And then we're like, well, why didn't she leave? Well, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, and on top of that, they have to hold down a job like all of us. Their child might, you know, have strep that day and they miss the day at work. Yeah. And what are the, what are, what are, what do we have? What, are, what is our safety net to help people move forward? And that's where we, we as friends and we as community members have to take upon ourselves to make sure people know there are resources. The resources are not magic wands. I mean, but they're small steps towards that. How do you work to safety? Um, I'm, a, you know, at Chum Task Force, we try to focus a lot on hope and, and change. And a lot of that is around our education department. It's, you know, um, and we see, we see the difference. See as you said, yeah. getting it out of the shadows, yes. being able to talk about it, losing some of the stigma, helping people understand it. They're not the only ones going through it. And there, there are safe places to at least get some help or get some, a starting point for seeking help. You know, that first step is so hard. And, and I think even like, time. And I 
Mm-hmm. I think when Rachel talked about like faith leaders, I think we need to think about it, particularly when we're thinking about our communities, right? Like what is our sign, like what is our messaging around this in our community? Is it only the other or is it us? So in our synagogues and temples, do we have signage around that says you are not alone and with a phone number, right? Of somewhere that feels comfortable to go to, right? Do we have policies in our synagogues and our JCCs and our day schools around how do we manage an order of protection? How do we include both parties when there's an order of protection for a bar mitzvah? Who goes to go, gets to go up to the bima? Right? We need to think these things through and rabbis need support, right? The clergy needs support to think these through so that people could still feel part of community. It isn't this overwhelming experience. Say, okay, if I make this decision to leave, like what happens to my kid, right? Will they be able to bar mitzvah in our community, right? Like, so how do we incorporate the She's Gone exhibit into some of the toolkits that can be distributed to the, the communities that you're talking about? Because it is visual and I don't know. There's a way to take um, the the work that Karen and Adi have done and use it as a way to introduce the topic in confirmation classes. I mean, starting young is a really important place to start and not waiting until somebody has already experienced experienced and been through the cycle. It's interesting, over COVID, um, you know, pre-COVID, we always had this dream of having a national youth program for our, our education department, but it never came together. And, you know, enter COVID, we've all become Zoom, you know, fluent. So we started a fellowship program we called the Purple Fellowship. Purple is the domestic violence and awareness color, where we have, I think it's 26 Jewish day schools across the country from all parts of the Jewish community that they're up to week, I think, eight this week, um, where they come together, um, juniors in high school. And they learn about domestic violence. They become peer educators. And then they, they are going to, during Dating Violence Awareness Month in February, they're going to um, ha- host a big awareness campaign in their school. So they all wear purple. I'm going to give that swag. But the neat part about it is that you're training young people how to, how to say those things, how to say you're not alone, how to, how to have those statements. How You know, you go into a, a Jewish day school and there's a, a bulletin board that says this now, right? You walk in there and it has purple all over it and it says you are not alone so recently um we got a chat on our chat line so which we opened up to have more access to youth where a young person chatted in and that a friend is one of these fellows and was concerned about her dating relationship you know these are these are 16 year olds they're dating right they're in relationships and and told her about expressed some of her concerns and said there's somewhere for you to talk and she was chatting into our chat line for support and that's where the hope is right like that to me is where we're starting the conversation young and a stigma these these 16 year olds are able to have this conversation um you know i i get the opportunity to to speak to this group once every semester every every semester and and at the end of the first time we ran the first cohort a young man said to me so how's this ever going to get better and i i felt like tearing up where i said it's going to get better because you're here right? right we have men and young men and young women in this zoom room talking about this you know and they're gonna you're gonna be the impact um so i think there are ways that we can do this better i I really do believe that because young people are are they're you know they know a whole lot more about guns you know at an early age i think they're they they are open to learning how to keep themselves safe and i think we have an obligation to help provide the information in an unvarnished way so that there's a way to deal a D with the emotional tools that men and boys have, women as well, and just get something done. And, you know, I just, I get very impatient. And so I think before we open it up to questions, Karen, let me close by asking you if you're working on a new exhibit or an extension of She's Gone or what, what's next for She's Gone and what's next for you. <laughs> Um, actually not. Okay. <laughs> I'm not working off anything new and now. I have an idea, but I am um, not ready to share it yet. About that. <laughs> um, we are moving forward uh, in order to visit as many uh, places as we can, uh, traveling the world, looking for uh, activists uh, and partnerships. Um, we are moving forward all the time, looking for uh, stages and places and galleries and venues to put those garments. Yeah, and it was really wonderful to be collaborating with the embassy and um, the wonderful people that we've met in this partnership, Michal and Emily, and uh, of course the minister and the work and the commitment that the embassy has to help 
not just spread the word about the the exhibit, but about the issue and and ways that that they can help as well. So with that, Suzanne, I think I will turn it back to you for questions. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you all for that very, very important conversation. I just want to make sure we have everybody. Um, the first question uh, that came in was, we've talked a lot about um, letting people know they're not alone, that there's resources, but what about what can we do to stop and prevent domestic violence to begin with? So that, you know, where do we, where do we begin? Somebody want to tackle that? Um, I, I can, I can start to, to tackle that a little bit. I think Shauna might want to um, weigh in as well. I mean, I think first of all, what the research says is that we need to be talking to kids when they're very, very young. I'm talking about elementary school age is when we start to talk about it. And teen dating violence in seventh grade, I would say sub sixth grade, seventh grade, like like really early. So that's that's one thing. Um, that's a sort of long term future, you know, like let's make a better future. I think also um, there has been traditionally, I think, great resistance in putting money into anti-violence programs for two reasons. One, there's questionable efficacy around them. And two, there's a fear, and I think a very valid fear, that it will take resources from victims. And, you know, if you have a choice, if you only have $100 and you can give it to a victim, or you can give it to a program to try to create um, you know, an abuser who becomes nonviolent, most people are going to give it to the victim, right? There's a sort of moral earning that, that they have done. I think, you know, one of the things that I would really like to see, at least in the U.S., where we have not reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act since 2013, is earmarking a new set of funds, not taking away from the funds that already exist, but earmarking new funds to try to encourage people to have some creative solutions to anti-violence. Because I do think it's really possible in the same way that I think somebody who can, who, you know, has an addiction problem and, and, you know, manages to become sober. Like th those are the people I look to and I think they managed to do it. They did it because they saw that there was a benefit to their own lives. I mean, that's that's sort of the key is understanding that their life will be better as well. And I I do think that there are really fantastic programs that are out there that we could replicate and we should be replicating. I, I also think, you know, the, the, as Adi said, you know, just allowing men in particular to explore their their full range of human emotions is is something that we, have gotten sort of less good at in recent years, which is baffling. I don't know, Shana, do you have uh, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I often think about like, how do we intervene with the batterers, the people that hurt or whatever language we're using now, because um, they, you know, we know from research that their, their adverse childhood experiences or ACEs scores are like four plus. They, you know, we know that many of them have traumatized, you know, and that's not an excuse. We're not calling that an excuse, but there's a lot going on there. And, and, and often the victims stay and we want them to be safe as well. And it often, does, it feels like it does come down to just a fight for allocation of resources. And as someone who runs a nonprofit, I get it, right? Like we need those resources for the people that we serve, but how can we not as a, as a, a society uh, value both like how can we not think of ways of value both and, and financing both because they both they really need funding um and there are you know uh, rachel and i when we were preparing there is a program in israel remember we were talking about this it's called um i called a colleague there i think it's called no um um and i don't want to be quoted on this but basically instead of incarceration the 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 male perpetrator or whatever, you know, goes into a kind of a halfway house where they have to work and they're in therapy. And so the family doesn't lose their the income and it's just a creative way. Now, is that a solution? I don't know. Um, but it, like trying to think out of the box because, right. um, you know, the families do, right, we need the, we, you know, you know, we don't want to get into a place where it's us against them either. We, you know, um, yeah. so that's, it's, so, but, but it's always grounded in 
the safety. And that's where people kind of get kind of you know, confused. It's always around the safety of the victims and the children. And then how else can we help? So I think that's really important. You know, I go back to making sure that we really focus on education. Like we need to give people yep. safe and healthy relationship skills, you know, and, you know, we always use this analogy of like, none of us get our driver's license without taking courses. And it seems so trite to say that, but, you know, we all enter relationships without having any real courses. And, you know, how do we as a society, like make it normal, right? Make normalize and destigmatize getting help making sure we have the capacity for relationships, making sure that if something doesn't feel right, we know we can get help, that there's nothing wrong with reaching out so that we do get help earlier, right? So that, you know, we don't get calls from people who are married for decades that we're getting, you know, and we do see that now. We get calls from people who are married shorter periods of time so they can at least address the issues that are, are more manageable. So in education, I'm very proud of the work we're doing with the youth because I, I see that as, you know, yes, it's a long-term payout, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the more we can work with our youth, the more the conversation at least is allowed, um, where, you know, I don't think that's always been true. Um, you know, yeah. it's interesting um, yeah. listening to you because I, I, um, I've read a lot of work by Peggy Ornstein, the writer Peggy mm -hmm. Ornstein, who has written some fantastic books, Cinderella, My Daughter, <laughs> which is one of my favorites. But she talks about, one of the things she talks about is that all of our our sort of cultural discussions around sex is about risk That's and right. reward for men. And I think that the absolute same is true about domestic violence. Like we're talking about the risk and dating violence, but we could reframe it and say, well, what does a healthy relationship actually look like? What is a healthy dating, you know, life consist of, especially for these kids who, who don't know. I mean, I was probably 30 <laughs> and still asking these kinds of questions, you know? <laughs> all, of us, all of us who are honest and have been in long-term relationships recognize that people struggle and how do we even like destigmatize that? Though it's not in the same continuum, right? Like there's, you know, but like, how do we, you know, I, I agree. Like if we talk about, you know, yes, in the sexuality world, we talk like positive sexuality and moving away from only the risk language, but in the relationship world, it's also more accessible that way, right? Especially if you're going into some more faith-based communities and insular communities, instead of going in there, it's like, we're here to talk about domestic violence. And, you know, we're, you know, it's this women's, the you know, women's batterers movement. We're here to talk about how do we promote healthy relationships and families. And that's something that we, we really do at our agency because of the communities that we serve. It's like, how do we talk about healthy family relationships? Nobody could protest that. Like, we all, we're all on board. Like, that makes sense to all of us. And how do we change the conversation um, and then give people skills and then also have allocation of funding to make that happen? And also, and also, you know, like, <laughs> there's right. a lot there. Start right. young and words matter, you know? We, we have yeah. to start young because right. many of the young children don't know that it's not okay to have mom be smacked around. You know, it's just what they know. And so we've got to intervene. Anyway, Suzanne, I think there's- yep, There's story. a few more. Um, okay. uh, K Karen, uh, first of all, I have to say, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to go into DC over the weekend and see the exhibit. And, and I really encourage people who are in the local area uh, to come see it before, it clo Robin, it closes on Friday is the last day. Yes. Um, I, I have to say, seeing the pictures that we put up before versus actually seeing it in person is a completely different experience. And, and it, the pictures just don't even do, do it justice. Um, so I thank you for, for bringing that. And so the question is, um, how has this exhibit been perceived um, internationally in other countries? Um, you know, what, what has the impact been and, and um, is it different than the impact it has had in Israel or in the United States? Actually, I will let uh, Adi answer this uh, question. Um, Adi, would you mind? Yes, of course. Um, so, as much as I know, um, I joined and really helped promote and took like personal um, practice in internationalizing the, the project. So in Israel, Karen was much more hands-on about it, and she shared with me a lot about um, it. It got a huge outreach, and people. It was like an endless stream of of people being deeply touched, and also contacting Karen. Um, every on every venue, every time, women, men, and sharing their stories and. Um, 
I really, actually, I do really don't know how Karen has the the emotional capacity to deal with all this um, um, such intense amount of 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 emotion and um, and and power and pain. Uh, I do know that in in on our, on our visits abroad, it's it's really overwhelming how. Not surprisingly, this is an international or a universal issue. Uh, we keep on mentioning it, but it's we, we should keep on mentioning it in every context. Um, I think people, women, men are extremely touched by it. I, I don't see a difference. I think I think every every woman, uh, especially if we could say so, um, you know. Um, the way a woman lives her life, the things she needs to think about um, since the moment she goes out of her house, outside, when she goes on the street, when she goes to work, um, the difference in the salary and just the person who is following her or the looks on the elevator, every small simple thing until the most extreme moment of, of murder, which is what our exhibition is dealing with, which is like the, the edge of the edge of, of oppression. But there are so many small subtle things. Um, I think every woman feels completely connected with, with the, um, the horrifying phenomenon. And it brings out the same thing wherever we go. And it, it, it has something, um, it might be a bit strange to say, but it has something um, I think it's important for the solidarity and for the power of the project because it's international, because we share the pain and it's the same everywhere. So of course, every place has its own small different attributes and different kind of ethnic or, or specific different manifestations of gender-based violence. But at the end, it's the same good old gender-based violence and I think we all share the, the pain and the solidarity and the cry to, and the call to action. Thank Can you. Can I just add one thing, Suzanne, yeah. which is um, Rachel, in, back to your book, um, there's one story where a woman who, um, her name is Victoria in the book, I don't know if it's her real name, but she's speaking to a number of men who are incarcerated. And it's one of the first times that the men have listened to a woman who has been victimized and abused. And she was very honest about what it was like. She was very young when it started. And by the end, that experience was transformational for both. Now, whether it lasts or not, is it in that moment, there was just real transformation. And it was the first time they were communicating. And one of the things he said, and I want to sort of end on a, on a note, um, without sugarcoating how much work we still have to do, he just said, hurt people hurt people, healed people heal people. And I think with the work that we're all trying to do in terms of somehow starting that process, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think we all have a responsibility individually and through our various communities to not be shy to talk about really difficult, painful topics, even though, you know, it's not something people want to spend a lot of time on. It really, we don't have a choice, really, in my opinion. So there you have it. Healed people heal people. So... Thank you, Robin. Um, we do have to wrap up, but I wanted to give everybody else if they had one last thing uh, before we officially end uh, to say. So um, who, who would like I, to go? Go ahead, Karen. I have one just sentence. I think like in Me Too, we have to break the walls of silence and shame. We have to encourage women to speak with their own voice and with their own faces and just to move the the, uh, uh, the uh, shame to the other side. I think it would be the best uh, thing to, to, to do. Just yesterday, I met a girl. She's 17 years old and she told me that last week she was raped in the party. So I asked, so I asked why you don't ask for help, why you don't go 
to, to uh, uh, talk to someone and tell about it. And she said, I think it's my fault, I'm ashamed. So a lot of work to do with that part of a motion. Can I say, yes, I just wanted to say, beside the discussion of this being an international global issue, what I found so interesting about She's Gone when I first met Karen was that even within Israel, which, you know, is kind of a microcosm and has so many different communities, uh, she has clothing from, uh, and I'm leaving things out, she has clothing from, from uh, somebody from Ethiopia, an immigrant, somebody from a Russian uh, uh, immigration community, uh, an Arab uh, Muslim woman. It, 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 I'm le it's just a cross section uh, of the society. And, and I think that even in the two garments that, that we found here, it was from very different kind of sectors of, of, of American society. So it just proves that this is, there's no escaping this, no matter who you are or where you're from or your socioeconomic or your educational background, that we really have work to do because this is just global in all ways. Rachel? Well, I was, I, I was gonna let others talk. I've said so much already. I just, I guess I really wanna thank Rochelle, uh, Karen and Adi. I, um, it's been incredibly moving for me to be part of this. Sometimes it feels like you're hollering into the wind, right? And um, I think the more we can expand to our individual networks and to our communities, you know, we're all part of systems. Um, formal and informal, right? We have our own family systems. We have our own friend groups. Our, maybe we have a book club. Maybe we belong to a cycling club. And I think those are just like, as Karen said, those are places where we can begin to have these conversations and take the shame away, right? Just talk to people about having listened to this tonight. Just talk to people about the exhibit, you know? Um, because we are part of this global community. We are interconnected and what hurts one hurts us all. So thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. I just, I guess just to echo what was just said, um, both with Karen and Rachel, um, it's really an honor to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't get down to DC this week. I would have loved to have seen it in person, but I think if all of us walk away um, from, from a presentation like this and tell few people about this really, you know, exciting thing that they heard about this really interesting thing, we're, we're dispelling that, that darkness, right? We're, we're shedding that light ourselves. And by letting people know, right, we could be that shamish, we could bring light to people and we can let them know that there are resources, that they're never alone. And you just never know who needs to hear it. That's the thing about domestic violence. It really crosses all lines. So, you know, you're in your book club, you're at your whatever, you know, um, your bar class, it doesn't, wherever you are in your life, right? And you mentioned you went to this and, and you just drop it, you never know how that will impact someone um, at, at the right time and help them get what they need. So, you know, I guess that's my, my challenge to everybody is all of us to do that together. Thank you. Robin, do you want to share uh, just uh, real quickly the address of uh, where you are? Sure. So um, the gallery is in Georgetown. It's 1631 Wisconsin Avenue. It's the Book Hill neighborhood in Georgetown. Parking is, you know, hit or miss. Um, but And we're open by appointment. And if you go to songincollection.com, all of the contact information is there. And, and I will be there quite a bit the next couple of days, but do call before you go. Um, and we also video have a videotape that Rochelle is going to be put up, uh, putting up on Remember the Women. So you will be able to see the opening reception. And we had um, several speakers there, um, some of whom you've heard this evening, some of whom um, were, were other speakers. So uh, you'll be able to see that shortly and um, really look forward 
to to having as many people come and visit as as possible in the next couple of days. And I wanted to let everybody know that I will be sending out an email uh, probably by tomorrow morning with a link to this uh, the recording of today's program, so you can share this with whoever you would like. Uh, also, I will include links to uh, she's gone the website. Uh, I will include links to Rachel's book as well as uh, the resources that Shauna had up on uh, the screen earlier. I will also have some um, links to Robin's gallery as well as Rochelle's uh, remember um, the remember. I'm sorry, remember the women. Remember the women. Yeah. Yes. And um, and I thank everybody for coming. I'm sorry we could not get to all of the questions, um, but please, uh, I'm sure if you uh, have something that was not answered, uh, you could send an email to me and I will forward it to the appropriate person. Again, thank you all for participating. We thank the embassy, the Israel embassy for helping to support uh, this program and bring it to, to us. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.